Um, so, uh, thanks everybody. I'm Paul Hill, as uh, Emmanuel said, uh, down here from Dalhousie University, which is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Well, it's like a nine hour drive, and I did it all this morning. Um, <laughs> that's why I was a little bit late, a little worried. Um, really, uh, my wife has a family, has a place just, uh, just down the coast from here, which means up the coast. But uh, So they're just down the coast from, from here, and uh, because of that, I get to break up my holidays down here every every two years on the visit to the optics class. So thank you, Emmanuel, for that. Um, and as a result, I don't really uh, hang around. I left my wife stranded with no phone, no car, and I also found her purse in the car. So. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be happy. She'll um, contact you. Yeah, she can contact me. So we're good. Um, so as Emmanuel said, I met him in the in the early 90s. I was leaving University of Washington on good terms, but I was leaving, and Emmanuel was just arriving on reasonably good terms. And uh, and uh, then then in 1995, Emmanuel and I uh, got involved in something called coastal mixing and optics. And my specialty is sediment, and in particular, especially at the time, was sediment that formed up into little clumps called flocks or, or aggregates. And uh, it was a pretty optics-y crowd there, and there wasn't a whole lot of interest in aggregates, and I, I don't remember what the question was, but I somehow said, does anybody want to work on this? And Emmanuel raised his hand. So since then, which is like 24 years later, we've gotten money from the Office of Naval Research to work on, on the problems that blend optics and sediment. So I'm going to start out by stating the obvious information on this slide, is that sediment indeed affects the optical properties of the water column. So this is a shot from the, the north shore of Kauai. Um, and none of you should ever go there because it's not a nice place. Um, it's, a, it's a place that's very beautiful and for, uh, until recently, it's been relatively free from development, but the, there were, there's these one-lane bridges that have limited, have limited the development. And the local people have wanted to limit the development for the most part. But lately, there's been uh, some excessive development, and when you have uh, irresponsible excessive development, you dig up the soil. When it rains, that soil gets washed out to sea, and you see things like this. So this is a this is an outflow plume of a small river that's flowing into a beautiful coral reef environment, and you can see the effects of the sediment directly. It's making the the water uh, red or brown or, or yellow, whatever your eyes see there, and the color word. I apologize. And then and then you have this beautiful blue um, coral reef water right next to it. Um, why is this a problem? Corals don't like sediment. It's gross. Um, oh, so the point is, is that because sediments affect the optical properties of the water column, you can use optical properties of the water column to figure out things about sediment. And that's what, that's what I try to do. Um, so why do, uh, first of all, how many people in here study sediment? Emmanuel said it was nearly everybody, so. <laughs> so good, we've got four or five. <laughs> um, so why do, why do you study sediment? Well, the, the, the most obvious reason um, it, for most of you is that sediment blocks light, so it affects primary productivity. This is, can be particularly acute in coastal waters where we're worried about phytoplankton productivity, but as well as uh, submerged aquatic center um, vegetation. Um, and. Uh, uh, suspended sediment also carries pollutants. Some of the pollutants that we care most about are hydrophobic, so they're looking for surfaces to glom onto. And what do they find most readily is small suspended sediment particles, again, in coastal waters. And that's my bias. I don't want to do coastal stuff. And then deposited sediment takes up space. It can be a navigational hazard. There's a bunch of other reasons, but, but they, these are some of the biggies. Um, this, is a, this is kind of a, a cool picture flying into Toronto. So this is the ocean's Great Lake. Um, uh, just after some severe thunderstorms, and you're seeing again the effect of some uh, poor development, where these little creeks are discharging a lot of uh, a lot of sediment out into the lake. So the, the this this figure kind of summarizes the uh, or it does summarize the approach that uh, Emmanuel and I with others have been taking over the years to try to use um, the the co correlation between sediment and optics to figure out things about how the ocean works. 
So on the bottom here, we use optical properties to figure out things about particle properties, but that flows both ways. You can use particle properties to say something about what the optical properties would be. And the uh, key particle properties that we worry about, I guess I could use this thing. It's not very bright, I won't use that. Um, the uh, key particle properties that we uh, care about are, are concentration. We'll see that has overriding effect on, on the optical properties, but also size and density or composition. The optical properties we uh, tend to use are scattering, um, including forward and backward absorbance and attenuation. Um, and then we want to use this knowledge of particles and optics to uh, figure out what you would see when you look down from above. If the, uh, if the Okay, so why would we use optics? I know this is probably trivial for, uh, for I've got my uh, slide. Oh, okay. Um, you guys know this stuff, but why use optics? Um, the collection of sediment is particularly uh, difficult because sediment, uh, interesting sedimentary environments are typically extreme environments. I tell people I study the gray ocean, I'm not a blue ocean guy, you know, because uh, you, need, you need energy to move sediment around, and that often means it's uh, not pleasant. Um, and the characterization of, of it's time consuming. Uh, you've all filtered, I assume. I've filtered many, many, I, I don't want to add up how many days of my life have been spent filtering, and then you've got to do the stupid weighing stuff, and then the size distribution. We use a Coulter counter. It takes forever. We, we do all these things, but they are time consuming. That means it's hard to characterize um, environments over long times and, and, uh, and uh, with great frequency. So why use remote sensing? Well, it's remote. You don't have to be in the environment at all. Um, you get time series of, of images. As you also know, not always optimal. And, but you get synoptic large scale images. This is just a, a little cutout of a, of a Landsat image that I put up for impressionistic reasons. Um, and uh, and uh, so you can, uh, if you put gear in the water, that gear costs a lot of money. You're not covering uh, broad areas, but with remote sensing, you can. Oh, I also meant to say at the beginning, I have, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground here, so I'm just going to talk really fast. So don't ask any questions. Um, <laughs> the message is just the reverse. If I'm losing you on anything, just stop me and I, uh, ask questions. So, OK, so um, always in the uh, past op optics lectures, and we think this is the fourth or so, um, I have focused on this bottom part of this, this, uh, this triangle here, which is linking optical properties to particle properties. Uh, more specifically, what optical properties can I use to learn about uh, sediment uh, particle properties? So I'm um, going to spend a little bit of time on this, but um, a little bit on Emmanuel's advice. I'm not going to tell you much about it, and I'm going to let you uh, think about it um, and see what we can figure out. So uh, the, the three principles that we've really worked on um, together the hardest um, are uh, the, the top one is the one with which I've been most involved, is that marine particles are typically aggregated. So they're clumps of particles, not just single particles. And those aggregates have a geometry that makes the projected area proportional to the sediment mass in suspension. Okay? So normally mass is proportional to volume, but with aggregated particles, there's void spaces in there. So um, area and mass are related. Um, the next one is the particle beam attenuation depends on particle size relative to the wavelength. And then the last one is that the backscatter ratio depends on the index of refraction. So, so uh, particles that are more mineral backscatter uh, more than particles that are less mineral. OK, so what this means is that optical properties are a good order one predictors of suspended particulate mass. This is from some recent work that we uh, <coughs> did in, in uh, the West Sea of, of Korea. Um, and what it shows is uh, output of an optical backscatter sensor. That's what the OBS means in, in volts versus the measured suspended particulate mass in grams per meter cubed. Um, and it's just from uh, uh, two different field campaigns. One, the concentrations were lower. It was in the springtime. Uh, but you see a good linear relationship. And then, and then uh, also you see a good linear relationship from the autumn when we had higher uh, suspended sediment concentrations and higher OBS outputs. Oh, yeah, this is confusing. OK. Um, the, uh, the next thing we've been working on is the backscatter slope and the slope of the attenuation. There's been more work done on this. Uh, backscatter slope is inversely correlated with particle size. 
Um, this is uh, data from the Columbia River, and I'll, I'll tell you more about these field campaigns later on. And what it's showing is Souter diameter. Have you done Souter diameter? You know what that is? Never mind. It's a, a representation of the, uh, of the uh, particle size in suspension that, that takes it into account the entire size range. Um, and it shows the backscatter spectral slope, um, uh, gamma BB. Um, and uh, what it shows you is that the, the spectrum flattens as you get to bigger and bigger particles. Okay, so you can use that to interrogate suspensions. And then the last one, this is from an Emanuel paper way, way back, 15 years ago, oh my God, um, showing uh, this is uh, uh, chlorophyll over CP at, at 660, and this is uh, uh, backscatter, over, um, uh, backscatter over total scattering, or that's the backscatter ratio. And what you see is this relationship where um, if you have more organic -y particles, you have lower backscatter ratios, and you have more inorganic particles, you have higher backscatter ratios. So that's what we've been using to try to interrogate particle suspensions and figure out what's there. Okay, so where we have done this, uh, uh, one of the places, well, last two projects we've done this in, in estuaries. So uh, what are estuaries? Just a real quick review. Estuaries are bodies of water where a river meets an inlet of the sea. So those are the ingredients. You need fresh water flowing in, and it needs to be in an inlet. Um, they are really important because they're often heavily populated. Half of the world's 10 most populous cities are on estuaries. Um, why is that? They offer water supply. They're a good place to tie up your vessels, good for trade. Um, but also, they're, they're very productive. Um, and uh, estuaries, it turns out, trap sediments like crazy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that causes real problems for navigation and also for water intakes. You don't want to be pulling sediments into your water intakes. But also they trap contaminants. I mean, a long time ago, the idea was you could put anything you wanted into the ocean, and it would get diluted, taken out to sea, no big deal. But uh, estuaries trap these contaminants and make uh, urban harbors particularly problematic for human health effects. So the, the, uh, the big deal in estuaries is the mixing that occurs between the fresh water that's coming in and the seawater that's, that's lying offshore. And there's a range of, of types of mixing in estuaries that depends on the competition between the amount of river water that's coming in and the amount of tidal energy that's available to mix that less dense river water with the, uh, with the saltier water offshore. So in ones where the rivers are dominant, these are called salt wedge estuaries. There's really limited mixing between the fresh and salt water. And as I said, it depends on the competition between the fresh water and the, and the tidal mixing. But there's limited mixing between the fresh and the salt water. Just think of this as the water that's coming in from the river just rides up over the ocean water. Um, partially mixed estuaries are intermediate, as the name implies. So there's some mixing of, of the, the uh, fresh water with the salt water. And then in well-mixed estuaries, which have relatively low inputs of fresh water relative to the, the energy available um, from the tides to mix, there's a lot of mixing uh, right as soon as the, the river enters the estuary. What would the Damascus River here be in that classification? Emmanuel, what would the Damascus River, this is a quiz, huh? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I could, I could find out. I could find out, uh, but I don't know what it is. It depends on the tides, right? So it, it always depends on the tide. Right. So the, the behavior of estuaries, uh, estuaries are like people study estuaries, and the estuaries become like their, their pets or their children, you know, where their estuary is the most complex and interesting in the world. Um, so the Damariscotta is the most interesting and complex estuary in the world. But they, they do change with the tides. They change with the fresh water. But it's pretty water. partially mixed. I mean, you can, sometimes you can go way upstream and you'll get pretty fresh water. But it doesn't look anything like a well-mixed estuary. There's always some sort of gradient in it between yeah. the tides. So what you see in the, so what these are isohalines here, lines of equal salinity. And in a well-mixed estuary, here's the river, here's the ocean. You just, it's like a washing machine. So the, the river water gets mixed with the ocean water. And what you see is just a, a, um, a, a gradient going offshore to higher and higher salinity. Contrast that with a salt wedge estuary here, where what we're seeing is that the, the river is strong enough to actually arrest or stop the penetration of that salt water into the inlet. 
and that river water just rides up over the salt water. And then in the partially mixed estuary, what you see is, a, is an intermediate between these. So what's happening is that there's mixing, some mixing occurring between the fresh water that's riding on top and the, the salt water below. And what that does is it draws some of that salt water out to sea, and that draws uh, some salt water from the ocean into the estuary. And this is one of the things that makes estuaries very productive. So you, you have this mechanism of drawing water in from the ocean that's richer in nutrients. OK, so estuaries are optically complex. So this is one of the reasons that we are, have done work in estuaries. It's, a, it's kind of the hardest test for using optics to figure things out because they're so complicated. So in situ, you have very variable particle concentration, which, as we'll see, um, exerts that kind of first order uh, effect on optical properties. But you have really variable particle size in estuaries um, uh, because this process of flocculation tends to uh, be weaker in fresh water than it is in salt water. When you bring in particles with a river, they meet the salt water and they start clumping up. So you get uh, big changes in particle size. And you also have really variable particle composition. You know, the, the fresh water can be productive, the salt water can be productive, but anyway, so there, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, um, and, and sediment gets resuspended from the bottom. Anyway, so there's, there's all sorts of things contributing different particle types. And from a remote sensing perspective, estuaries are really <laughs> tough because you have variable atmospheric conditions. Estuaries, by definition, are an inlet of the sea, so you have land on either side. That can cause problems with, with your atmospheric correction. You've got adjacency effects. It's just, a, it's just a terrible place to do optics. So that's why we decided to do optics there. So, um, this, uh, so what we're going to do now is talk briefly about the Columbia River estuary. It's a very large, very dynamic estuary on the west coast um, between um, Washington and, and Oregon. And uh, the uh, Office of Naval Research was doing some work out there, and we, uh, we got involved with that. And a lot of work has been done on the Columbia. So when we went in there, we didn't really think we were going to discover anything new about the sediment processes there. What we were really doing is saying, let's go into a well-studied estuary <laughs> where we know how the sediment and particle properties work, and let's see whether we can figure out what's going on with optics. So this is a general model from my student. This is Jing Tao. She was in the class in uh, 2015. Yes. Yeah. Um, just finishing up her PhD now. Uh, so this is a figure from a recent paper in, in uh, JGR Oceans. And it shows just a general model for sedimentation in uh, really any partially mixed estuary. Um, and s uh, we won't get into, anyway, so uh, this, this is basically what, how a, a partially mixed estuary works. So the river's up here, the ocean's here. And what she has is lines showing um, uh, uh, different isohalines. The uh, S naught is the boundary between fresh and slightly salty water. I, I can't remember exactly what her definition is. And this is at, at uh, uh, seven parts per thousand there. Now, I'm not going to get into that kind of detail here, but that's what those lines are. And what we see are different kinds of particles coming in here. The brown ones are the beautiful sediment particles, and the green ones are the, uh, are the, the phytoplankton or organic rich matter. And what it shows is that the river water brings in generally uh, disaggregated particles. So these particles aren't clumped up with one another. There. Um, as they cross into slightly salty water, uh, the particles start to, to clump with one another in the process of flocculation. And some of those uh, develop settling velocities that are large enough that they are taken to the bottom. Others are transported in that buoyant surface plume out to sea. Now remember in a partially mixed estuary, you're, you're grabbing a little bit of that, that uh, salt water and taking it out to sea. You can't just leave a hole in the ocean. You've got to replace that with water from offshore so that at the bottom you have this inshore, what's known as residual flow, that brings particles that have sunk into this layer back to the, the, uh, the, the front of this salinity intrusion. So you have a spot there called an estuarine turbidity maximum where sediments are accumulated. OK, any questions on that? So the question we had basically was, are optical measurements effective at mapping out these changes in particle properties in a dynamic estuary? 
Okay, so what I would like you to do now is either alone or ideally by talking with uh, your, your classmates is to say what, hap what would happen to backscatter the backscatter spectrum and the backscatter ratio as, <coughs> as you move from the river through this, this transition into, into the uh, ocean. So just take a few minutes, think about what, you know, where would backscatter be high, where would it, you know, how would it be changing, what would you see in the, in the uh, backscatter spectrum, and what would you um, see in the backscatter ratio. So do they have the background to be able to, to, to do this? All right, so go for it. And if you don't know, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. 